On the Sunday afternoon of January 1st, 2006, a man and his daughter arrived at his friend's family house for a New Year's get-together party. He finds the door open, which was a usual thing the hosts did during their parties. Upon entering, he encountered a thick cloud of smoke, prompting him to alert others, and they contacted the authorities. Firefighters swiftly arrived, extinguished the fire, but tragically discovered the lifeless bodies of the party hosts, the Harvey family. What initially seemed like a fire-related incident turned into a chilling revelation. The Harveys had not succumbed to the flames, but rather fell victim to something far more sinister, and it was now a murder investigation. This left the investigators not only emotionally shaken, but also bewildered at the grim turn of events. What really happened here, and who had murdered them? This is the heartbreaking case of the Harvey family. Forty-nine-year-old Brian Tabor Harvey, a local icon, gained recognition in the 1980s as the singer-songwriter for the underground indie band House of Freaks. Despite parting ways professionally with his musical partner Johnny Hot in the 90s, they remained close friends. Brian, a devoted musician, took the stage for the last time at a New Year's Eve show that was sadly and unbeknownst to him the final night of his life. On the other hand, 39-year-old Catherine Elizabeth Grabinski achieved success as the co-owner of the popular toy store World of Mirth, located in Richmond's Carrytown district. A community pillar, she was an artist involved in various endeavours, from painting sets for community theatre to working as a pastry chef and waitress. Catherine had an older sister, Shelley Grabinski, and was also the half-sister of actor Stephen Culp, known for his roles in The West Wing and Desperate Housewives, among other films. The paths of Brian and Catherine would eventually cross at the Border Cafe on Main Street, where Catherine worked, and Brian frequently visited with Johnny. In 1990, they tied the knot, and the House of Freaks released an album featuring a song dedicated to Catherine titled I Got Happy. The couple welcomed two daughters into their lives. Stella Ann, their first daughter, was born in 1996. Reflecting on fatherhood, Brian expressed on a fan website, I think I've come pretty close to knowing why I'm here on earth since my daughter was born. I think you have to be hopeful about life when you have a child. You owe it to them. Their second daughter, Ruby May, was born in 2001. While Brian continued his musical pursuits, he also took on a job working on computers for the Henrico County school system. Kathy, on the other hand, embarked on the entrepreneurial path by opening World of Mirth, a unique toy and gift store that became a cornerstone in the fashionable Carrytown neighbourhood. Her brother, Stephen Culp, explained in court, she wanted to create a space where parents could come with their kids and spend time, and kids could play with the toys. There's no guns or swords or anything like that there. It's a wonderful place. The Harveys established their home in a stately old neighbourhood on the south side of Richmond that had large trees, porch swings, and ivy-covered surroundings. They had a family room in the basement of their two-story red brick house. The beautiful family were well-known and beloved in the community of Richmond, and no one really had bad intentions towards them, or so everyone thought. On New Year's Day, Sunday 2006, Brian, his wife Catherine, and their two daughters, nine-year-old Stella and four-year-old Ruby, anticipated a bustling day ahead. Their plans included hosting a lunchtime barbecue for friends and family, prompting them to rise early and make preparations for the upcoming festivities. It had become a tradition for them to throw a party every New Year's Day, gathering their extensive circle of friends for the occasion. On that particular Sunday morning, Brian ventured outside their residence in the fashionable Woodland Heights area of Richmond, Virginia, to retrieve the newspaper. Absorbed in the front page news, he returned indoors without locking the door. But since they lived in a relatively safe neighbourhood, this wouldn't normally have been a cause for concern. Typically, they also didn't secure the door on party days, leaving it open for arriving friends. However, on this fateful day, unbeknownst to Brian, opportunistic criminals were clandestinely lurking nearby. Catherine busily prepared cookies in the kitchen for the anticipated guests who were due to arrive shortly. Suddenly, she heard voices emanating from the living room, assuming someone had arrived earlier than expected. To her dismay upon approaching, she was confronted not by familiar faces, but by two unknown men. In the tense moments that ensued, Brian, Catherine and young Ruby were directed downstairs to the basement playroom. 
Stella, who had spent the previous night at a slumber party, had yet to join them. Once the family was confined to the small space, the intruders used electrical cords and packing tape to bind them, assuring that cooperation would prevent any harm towards them. As they proceeded to ransack the house, a knock on the front door interrupted them, occurring around 10 a.m. The apparent leader of the group released Catherine from her restraints and instructed her to deal with whoever was at the door. However, before permitting her to leave, he issued a stern warning. If she sought help or attempted to escape, her daughter and husband would be murdered. As Stella's arrival was imminent, a distressed Catherine found herself caught in a difficult dilemma. Answering the door would expose her daughter to the same peril as the rest of the family, while ignoring the persistent knocking could incur the wrath of the assailants who clearly held the upper hand. Ultimately, she concluded that cooperation was the most prudent choice, and with that decision, she opened the door. In an unexpected turn of events, Stella swiftly darted past Catherine and made her way directly to the playroom, where the family usually spent a lot of time together. Acting quickly, Catherine intercepted her daughter's friend, preventing her from following. Kirsten Perkinson, the friend's mother, later recounted her surprise at Catherine's unusual behaviour, which deviated from her typical exuberance. In response to Perkinson's inquiry about her well-being, Catherine, normally lively, claimed to be unwell. She gestured with a circular motion to the side of her head, mimicking a gun to indicate someone might be considered crazy, abruptly ending the conversation and shutting the door. This peculiar gesture would later trouble Perkinson, who wondered if Catherine was attempting to convey something. Was Cathy being monitored by the intruders? Could she have attempted an escape, potentially saving herself and Stella? However, the dilemma of leaving Brian and Ruby behind weighed heavily on Catherine's mind. Perkinson departed, planning to return later for the party. With all four Harveys now inside the house, Catherine returned to the basement and discovered a terrified Stella, who had been securely tied up alongside the rest of the family. As everyone lay bound and vulnerable, chaos erupted. Suddenly and without warning, the man in charge revealed a knife sourced from the Harvey's own kitchen and began slashing their throats, including those of the young girls. Expressing frustration that they were not succumbing quickly enough, he instructed his accomplice to bludgeon their heads. However, the partner refused, prompting the assailant to grab a claw hammer and ruthlessly strike them repeatedly until they stopped moving. After removing Catherine Harvey's wedding ring, the assailants ignited the room, using wine as an accelerant to conceal evidence of their heinous acts. As they made their escape from the residence, they indulged in a plate of freshly baked cookies that sat cooling on the kitchen counter and stole a laptop, DVD player, and various other items. Rushing out, they entered the getaway vehicle parked outside. Inside the getaway vehicle was a woman who was in a relationship with one of the men, serving as a lookout during what was initially intended as a simple robbery. They swiftly departed, leaving the scene just as inconspicuously as they had arrived. Sometime later, at around 1.30pm, Johnny Hot arrived for the celebratory gathering. Upon opening the front door, he was greeted by a thick cloud of smoke pouring out. Alarmed by the pungent odour of burning, he alerted the neighbours who quickly dialed 911. As emergency responders entered the premises and dealt with the fire, unfortunately they encountered four bodies in the smouldering basement, still intact. Investigators at the scene soon deduced that the fire did not result in their demise, but rather a more sinister cause of death was unveiled and this had now become a murder investigation. Police officers and paramedics, who were accustomed to witnessing the darkest aspects of humanity, were reported to have found the harrowing scene so distressing that some openly shed tears. The revelation that the parents had been compelled to witness the brutal demise of their children, and vice versa, was sad to imagine. Autopsies disclosed that Brian and Catherine met their end due to blunt force trauma to the head. Stella, tragically, succumbed to a combination of blunt force trauma and smoke inhalation, suggesting she was alive when the fire ignited, despite her grievous injuries. Ruby's demise resulted from stab wounds to her neck and back. Despite initiating an immediate investigation into the murders, the authorities had little evidence. Recognising the potential for criminals to divulge information, they appealed to the public for assistance. And fortunately, their breakthrough came a few days later. On January 6th, a woman named Latoya Pauly contacted the police, urging them to conduct a welfare check on her friend, 21-year-old Ashley Baskerville Tucker. Pauly expressed her concerns as she believed that Ashley, Ashley's boyfriend, 29-year-old Ray Joseph Dandridge, 
and his uncle, 29-year-old Ricky Javen Gray, were involved in the Harvey family's murder. Ricky, who was slightly younger than his nephew by a few months, was said to be the one in charge. The shocking revelation continued as Pauly disclosed that the two men had stashed evidence of their crimes at her residence. She revealed that Gray and Dandridge had recently visited her home with a laptop that had an image of the Harveys as its wallpaper. The Harvey case had by then received extensive coverage in the news, leaving no doubt that the laptop belonged to them. Additionally, Latoya provided intricate details about a scheme devised by Ashley, Gray and Dandridge to rob Ashley's parents. In this plan, Ashley was supposed to act as a hostage, allowing Ricky and Gray to extort money from the Baskerville Tuckers, which would portray Ashley as innocent. Despite being privy to the entire plan and being offered a role, Latoya declined, becoming suspicious of the trio. The uncle and nephew were the only ones that returned hours later, and when asked about Ashley's whereabouts, they cryptically replied, Ashley has gone bye-bye. This statement heightened Latoya's concerns, prompting her to contact the police. It was this crucial information that investigators needed to start connecting the dots. Having confirmed Latoya's information, investigators proceeded to the residence where Ashley resided with her mother, 46-year-old Mary Baskerville Tucker, and stepfather, 55-year-old Percy L. Tucker. To their horror, they encountered yet another gruesome scene. Upon entering the home, they discovered the lifeless bodies of all three victims, subjected to a brutal method similar to the Harvey family's fate. The victims were bound, gagged, and had their throats mercilessly slit. Duct tape, wound tightly around their heads, inflicted additional suffering on Mary and Perciel, who both displayed deep neck lacerations. Perciel had a sock forcibly inserted into his throat. Ashley, tragically, was found to have been suffocated with a plastic bag. The common cause of death for all three was determined to be suffocation and torture. Suspecting the presence of thrill killers, law enforcement agencies from across the region collaborated in a joint effort to apprehend them before they could perpetrate further atrocities. Similar to the Harveys, Perciel and Mary led quiet lives without harboring any enemies. Perciel worked as a forklift operator, while Mary was employed by a housekeeping business. Their tranquil existence was shattered by the betrayal from their own daughter, ultimately leading to the tragic demise of an innocent couple who sought to enjoy their golden years. The investigators swiftly uncovered the crucial link between the Harveys and Tuckers. Ashley was found wearing Brian Harvey's wedding band, the same one that was missing and taken from Catherine. With this revelation, urgent action was imperative to apprehend Gray and Dandridge before they could inflict further irreparable harm. Having traced their movements back to their home state of Pennsylvania, Gray and Dandridge were captured in Philadelphia on January 7th. In his questioning, Dandridge asserted that the murders had been conceived by his uncle, and he had merely followed instructions. Faced with these incriminating accusations, Gray readily admitted to the killings of the Harveys and his involvement in those of Ashley and her parents. While these straightforward confessions were enough to leave anyone astounded, it became apparent that this was just the beginning. Gray provided gruesome, intricate details of both family massacres, emphasizing that their actions were driven solely by the need for money. During the Harvey family murders, unbeknownst to everyone, he was under the influence of PCP. PCP, or phenylcyclohexyl piperidine, is a drug known for inducing auditory and visual hallucinations, as well as violent behavior. Throughout his confession, Gray maintained a chilling, emotionless stare. His utter indifference towards the lives he took led investigators to believe they were face to face with the devil incarnate. It was also revealed that Gray was responsible for the murder of his wife, Trevor Terrell Gray, whose body was uncovered in a shallow grave on Brookside Avenue in Washington, Pennsylvania. The couple had been married for six months prior to her tragic murder and resided together in a house owned by Trevor's family, along with Gray's nephew, Ray. According to Trevor's parents, the Grays frequently engaged in bitter arguments. Claw marks on Ricky's forearm were even discovered on the day Trevor's body was found. Despite being interviewed by Washington police, neither Gray nor Dandridge were initially considered suspects. Marna Squires, Trevor's mother, alleged that law enforcement assumed Trevor had succumbed to a drug overdose, leading to a lackadaisical investigation into her death. Although Trevor's demise was deemed suspicious at the time, a homicide investigation was only initiated after Gray's confession in 2006. On December 31st, 2005, a brutal assault unfolded, 
where 26-year-old Ryan Carey was attacked by two men in front of his parents' Arlington home, who were later identified as Gray and Dandridge. The assault left Carey with severe beating and stab wounds to the chest, neck, and arms, resulting in a near-fatal assault that caused him to spend the following two weeks in a coma. Additionally, he permanently lost the use of his right arm. On February 9, 2006, Ricky Gray faced five charges of capital murder, while Ray Dandridge was indicted on three counts of murder for his involvement in the Baskerville Tucker killings. Despite their earlier admissions, both men pleaded not guilty. After a six-month trial, the jury found Gray guilty on all counts, leading to a life sentence for the murders of Brian and Catherine Harvey. In response to the brutal taking of Stella and Ruby's lives, the court deemed nothing less than a death sentence appropriate. In September 2006, following his uncle's conviction, and after learning the verdict in his case, Dandridge opted for a plea deal to evade the death penalty. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In December 2006, Ricky Gray faced charges from Culpeper County for the murder of Cheryl Warner, a 37-year-old legal secretary and mother of three. Warner was discovered shot and hanged by an electrical cord in the basement of her burning Reaver residence. Gray entered a not guilty plea. However, on June 4, 2008, the charge was suspended due to conflicting evidence. Over the subsequent nine years, Gray's legal team pursued numerous appeals, primarily arguing that their client suffered from diminished capacity due to an abusive childhood. The case reached the Supreme Court, where it was summarily rejected in 2016. In November 2016, Gray was scheduled to be executed on January 18, 2017. On January 18, 2017, with all of his appeals exhausted, Ricky Gray was executed by lethal injection at Greensville Correctional Center. Ray Dandridge still remains incarcerated at Sussex II State Prison. The brutal murders of the Harvey family unleashed an overwhelming wave of horror and sorrow with over 1,400 individuals attending their memorial service, expressing their condolences and grief. In front of Kathy's store, flowers and dolls piled up and formed a poignant tribute. Along the curb outside the red brick house, children placed candles which maintained their glow for weeks. A neighbor reflected on the community's collective mourning, stating, we kept those candles lit for weeks. Kathy's brother, Culp, testified about the profound impact of the murders, describing them as a lightning bolt to the heart that felt bottomless. He further expressed, it kills me to think about their last hours. We are all trying to get past this. You know, we owe it to them and to their spirit. Within Richmond's Forest Hill Park, an entrance to a footbridge is adorned with a granite monument, a poignant dedication to the Harvey family. This family, who had previously enjoyed many joyful moments at the site, saw their lives abruptly and tragically cut short. A bronze plaque, depicting their radiant smiles, serves as a commemoration of happier days before the unfathomable evil infiltrated their lives, devastating everything in its wake. It is sad and unfortunate what all the victims faced against these monsters. As we reflect on this heart-wrenching tale, our thoughts are with the victims whose lives were tragically cut short and the loved ones they left behind. If you found this video compelling, be sure to like it and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget check out our other videos. Thank you for watching.